Ladies and gentlemen, many of you got into chess after 2020. Maybe you didn't get into chess, maybe you played it when you were younger, but you definitely started watching more of it online and playing more of it online. And some of you don't know the crazy tumultuous history that chess has had. Today I am taking you back to how one of the best chess players in the world was basically scammed out of one million dollars in the year 1998. This video is split into a few parts. First of all, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an intro, then we're gonna look at the games, and then we're gonna talk about the aftermath. So, 1993. Garry Kasparov is the champion of the world, but he is having problems with FIDE, the international governing body of chess, so he creates PCA. He creates the Professional Chess Association, and he plays a match sponsored by Intel, a massive, massive company against Nigel Short. Gary defends the world championship, and a couple of years later, he plays against Vishwanathan Anand for another world championship title. Now, at that point in 1996, Intel decided that they were no longer going to sponsor the PCA for whatever reason. You can dive into the history. Obviously, we can talk to people from 25 years ago, but that was the arrangement. Fast forward two years. It's 1998. The two world championships are completely split, and Gary's like, I want to defend my title against the best player in the world. Vladimir Kramnik, you are going to play Vishwanathan Anand. You're going to play a match. You're going to play me. Here's a prize fund. Vichy declines. Now, I think Vichy declined because he was competing in the other cycle. He was competing in the FIDE cycle. So they took the fourth best player in the world named Alexei Shirov. Remember that name. That is the protagonist of today's video. Alexei Shirov and Vladimir Kramnik agree to play a match. The winner of this best of 10 match will play Garry Kasparov for the World Chess Championship. Now, if you play Garry Kasparov, there is a promise of a nearly $1 million prize for even losing that match. There was supposed to be a sponsor for the upcoming Gary match of $2 million, okay? So going into this match, Shirov and Kramnik are negotiating what are they going to do to split their own prize fund. A sponsor has put up $200,000. Not so bad for a chess match, right? So the players discuss amongst themselves, and rather than splitting it, they agree to something very unique. The loser will make the prize fund of the match. Why? Because the winner is guaranteed a spot against Garry Kasparov and at least a million dollars for losing. Do you kind of see where this is going? Let's jump into the match. We are in uh, Spain, a remote region of Spain. Vladimir Kramnik and Alexei Shirov are set to do battle, but they have not signed any contracts. Yes, you heard that right. The organizers, the lawyers involved, are stringing them along. There is actually no pen put to paper. Technically, there is no official match. Vladimir Kramnik has talked about this uh, in an interview that he did for the channel uh, Levit of Chess, uh, and uh, it was an interview in Russian, which I understood, given that I speak the language. Now, I'm gonna show you the first three games. This is very important. Game number one, with the white pieces, Kramnik plays a principled uh, Queen's Gambit position, and Shirov responds with a uh, Grunfeld defense. We have a main line position, and now bishop c4. The craziest thing is this remains the main line to this day. So 30 years later, 30 years ago, they were playing the critical stuff. Castles, knight e2, c5, and a position that is extremely sharp from the opening. Black is trying to fight at white center with the bishop, the knight, the pawn, the bishop, the queen. The Grunfeld is one of the most complex openings in chess because as you can see, you surrender the entire center, but you fight for the center from a distance and from the side. And Shirov was going into this as basically Drago. How many of you have seen Rocky, right? Drago was a tank and Shirov is a big guy. And he was training every day, eight hours, sport and chess. He was ready to win this match and he was ready to take on Garry Kasparov, right? And let's keep in mind, you lose this match, still make, still make a good, good amount of money, right? So Bishop D3 takes, takes, Bishop E6, and Shirov escapes with the pawn on a2. But it looks like white is going to be winning a little bit of material here. Well, black plays bishop to b3, and somehow is able to preserve everything. But Kramnik has a really nice looking position. It's kind of ridiculous that black is really able to deal with the fact that the pieces are so tied down on the queen side. But what ends up happening in game number one is the players get to a situation where they just trade down and agree to a draw right here. Why did they agree to a draw? Well, I guess Shirov was happy with the draw in game one. His opening was obviously successful. Yes, we see the eval is 0.6 here for black, but black would have to take certain concrete risks with the move f5, 
bishop g5 and so on. I think Shirov was just happy to make a draw with the black pieces basically effortlessly against the positional maestro like Vladimir Kramnik. And so we go to game number two. How is Shirov going to apply pressure? And well, he plays e4. Shirov, one of the best tacticians, uh, an initiative type of player, one of the most aggressive players of all time, has won many beautiful games and even holds the record for I think the most beautiful move ever played. Uh, and that was in the game uh, versus Veselin Tapalov. Unless Shirov was on the receiving end of bishop h3, but I'm pretty sure he played it himself. So, this one, a Petrov, and the move d4, another main line that has been played 30 years later and 30 years prior. So, these two gladiators were playing things that never change. And if you're just new to the world of chess, that is actually very common. Like, it's very common for, uh, for theory to change over time. We learn more about the game every single day sometimes, it seems. Uh, Kramnik took the pawn here and then played the move d5. The craziest thing is this position literally occurred in a match that I covered today. Arginary guy see David Paravian in an online rapid championship for chess.com. It's pretty nuts that even back then they were playing these main lines and they knew so much. So Kramnik was a uh, was a theoretician. All right, he he with black was a scientist. He was going to neutralize you. It didn't matter what you played. He would kill the game off, and that was the best way to beat Shirov. Right, like Shirov being an aggressive player who was an absolute beast when the game was going down, uh, kind of like downhill like a snowball. So Queen H5. Threat of mate, black blocks, rook b1. And the craziest thing is even this position was played recently in the candidates. Just goes to show you, like, these guys were ahead of their time. They were the pioneers uh, on a trail that had not really been explored. It's a knightless game. Nobody likes horses. C4. And Kramnik just doing a nice job kind of parrying the threats, trading off some pieces. And you might be thinking, Levy, this is not particularly interesting. I'm going to click off the video. I'm going to say, no, don't do that. Why is your attention span that bad? Trust me. You're going to want to stick around for the drama. Rook f7. And we have a repetition of moves. You see, Levy, what the heck, man? Two games, two draws. Where is the excitement? Well, after game three, a lot, a lot of things changed. Um, game number three, Kramnik once again had the white pieces, and you're going to notice a lot of similar moves. Shirov relying handily on the Grunfeld defense, which up until that point was ultra-tested in modern theory at that time, but didn't have all the intricacies and discoveries that it had today. Now, the average seven-year-old knows more about the Grunfeld than most of the people in the 20th century of chess, which is kind of insane. Bishop c4, knight e2, and a lot of the same stuff. Bishop g4, all this, you notice, but now bishop takes, ooh, okay. So Kramnik in the last game played the move bishop to d3, but now he gives away the bishop. He gives it away because that's called a desperado. When you're going to lose a piece, you forcefully lose it, gain something, and then immediately capture the free thing that you have available. So Kramnik is a pawn up. Take, king takes. And for a brief moment, it is in fact true, Shirov is a pawn down. But Shirov has something known as compensation, all right? Some people compensate for being otherwise boring and uninteresting by having flashy things on them or in their possession. But in this case, Alexei Shirov is compensating for the fact that he's down a pawn by being extremely aggressive with moves like e5, counterattacking with the queen on the king, the knight is coming in from this side, and it's anything but clear whether or not the pawn advantage is felt. Here comes queen h4 and bishop h6. The dark squares are completely under lock here. However, Kramnik, after the move queen d3, holds a very stable uh, positional advantage. He is just clearly up a pawn. But in chess, you cannot just say, I'm a pawn up, and therefore I am winning. You actually, unfortunately, have to win the game of chess. So here comes queen e3, a trade, and Kramnik is going to try to put a rook out at some moment, like right now, and push the pawn. But here comes rook f2. I think Kramnik needed to play this, rook f2, and rook e1, okay, with the intention of hitting the bishop, and then maybe getting the knight to the f3, very important f3 square, and then trying to roll these pawns down the board. Kramnik didn't do it that way, instead opting for the rook going to d1, pushing the pawn, but here comes rook f2, and doing it this way allows black to potentially reconsolidate. This was the last moment where Kramnik uh, had an opportunity to secure a very strong advantage. He got to a knight versus bishop endgame, uh, very clearly a pawn up, but black has a strong fortress, and uh, this uh, idea that Kramnik played g3 just simply did not work. There was an opportunity for him to go venture and try to win this pawn, but then black would have played a5. And had he gone and ventured to get this pawn, black would have played b5 or a4. And as this knight would have tried to return home, the pawns would have ran. And it would have been a crazy race to try to, 
you know, to try to survive this, right? Because these two pawns at the end of the day are very, very scary. You can be a pawn up in an endgame, but if I get a queen, that's now eight pawns up for the other guy. And rather than doing all that, Kramnik decided g3, and all this, and the players ended up making a draw. Why do I say the match changed after the third game? Match changed after the third game because, as Kramnik detailed in his interview, nobody had showed up to sign any contracts. He wasn't even sure if the players were getting paid or if there was any guarantee whatsoever of playing Garry Kasparov. So what did Kramnik do? He told his team, I'm going to finish game four, and if nobody signed this damn contract, I'm leaving. We are all getting on a plane, and this match is not happening anymore. I'm done. I'm done. I'm stressed. This is driving me nuts. I can't play my best chess. Here comes game four. Kramnik with the black pieces once again goes for a Petrov. Both these guys stubborn, but at the same time brilliant, so they know what they're getting themselves into. Uh, this one a little bit different, right? We see this early c4 that didn't happen last time. Queen h5 this way, and black has sacrificed the pawn on d5. However, black has very, very powerful bishops and has anything, uh, any, anything but a bad position. The bishops are really strong, and here come black's rooks as well. And ultimately, uh, we have check, and queen takes d5. A position that is literally completely equal. Queen bishop, opposite colored bishops, which are a draw, right? But the game goes on. Game goes on, right? We have this mildly unpleasant position. And basically, Shirov is... This is not a Shirov-esque kind of game. But listen, Shirov is one of the best players in the world. He could do whatever he wants, right? So rook d1. Now, why is this not completely equal anymore? Well, because these pawns are kind of targets. And you win one pawn, that develops into an advantage. Maybe you'll win a second pawn. Maybe you go on to win the game. Bishop d4, right? Stockfish is... Just wants to just go home. All right, Stockfish... It's done. It's calling me an idiot for even clicking through the moves. But there is a chance that you do something kind of silly here. Now, Shirov trading the rooks would basically guarantee a draw. This is basically an unlosable position. You might wonder, how is it unlosable? It, because it actually makes no difference if the pawn is lost. At the end of the day, white is up one pawn. If white tries to promote that one pawn, black will sacrifice the bishop for it. So mathematically speaking, it will be king and bishop versus king, which is unwinnable. And that is obviously what Kramnik had in mind. So he was like, all right, let's end this game. I'm out of here. These idiots haven't signed the contract. Here we go. I'm going to make this draw. Let me grab this pawn real quick. Thanks, Alexi. Yep, thank you. Grab the pawn. Wait. Ramnik even thinks that this endgame is a draw, down two pawns. Okay, maybe there's like a slight chance, but I think something's gone a bit wrong. I don't think that was part of the plan. Bishop f1, okay. Rook f8, he's trying to make the white king uncomfortable, but the white king's running, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, the king has gotten out of, se uh, king d7. Is this a draw? Can you blockade the pawn somehow? No, I don't think so. The white king makes it all the way around. This is a completely winning endgame. Bishop f2. A5, B4, B5, B6. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Vladimir Kramnik goes down in round number four of this match, and suddenly everything's changed. Why? Well, as Kramnik described in his interview, yes, the contract hasn't been signed, but he didn't want to make a big deal about it because now people would have had an excuse. They would have been like, oh, well, he lost. He couldn't hold his nerves. He's clearly not the best player. He's not fit to play Kasparov. We shouldn't take his complaint seriously. Kramnik said, you know what? Screw all these bozos. I'm going to stick around. We have a deal. The verbal agreement is the fact that the winner of this match plays against Gary Kasparov. That is no joke. The loser of this match gets $200,000. The winner gets nothing because they're guaranteed a spot against Gary maybe a year later or two years later. All right? Now I can't leave. All right? This sucks. I should have thought about this before I showed up here. All right? This sucks. But here we go. And it came down to this game. If Kramnik wins this game with the white pieces, he's going to tie the match. If he loses this game, the match is over. Alexis Shirov is the winner. And then we talk about the aftermath. Kramnik began with d4 and decided, I'm going to play f3. I am tired of playing into Shirov's uh, Grunfeld. I'm going to play a sideline. The whole point is, I'm still going to go here, but now e4 and he can't take on c3. So white is going to get a giant center. Visually, this looks stunning. The problem is here comes e5 and c6. But here's h4. This is Kramnik trying to do Shirov right back at Shirov. We have h4, and if black takes in the center uh, and just kind of lazily develops a piece, like let's say knight bd7, he's just going to get blown off the board with h5. Just h5, bishop h6, battery, boom. So h4, h5 from Shirov. 
Now we have this, but now white shoves the pawn forward, and black is at a little bit of an unpleasant position. Here comes bishop g5 with the pin, rook d1, knight h3, and Shirov says knight c4, here. But all of a sudden, the position is quite unpleasant. Not only is it quite unpleasant, it is literally losing for Shirov. This is disaster, all right? This is a disaster for the man that's supposed to win the match and challenge Garry Kasparov. There's a couple of plans here, okay? D7 for Kramnik. The idea is that you want to follow it up over the top with knight d5 with a strong initiative. Black can continue to try to defend. We have bishop f6, bishop f6, knight f6. Uh, you cannot go here. This pawn is still kind of standing there, you know, but maybe I'm going to try to apply a little bit of pressure. Castle, play the move f4. a4 first, then castle, then go here. It's a very, very complicated position, though. All right, maybe you don't want to go d7. You want to slow play, get a knight into the middle first, maybe g4 in the future, but it's anything but clear. Kramnik does it forcefully. He plays the move knight d5 right away, but that allows the vicious counter shot e4. And Kramnik plays bishop, uh, knight takes f6, bishop f6, and the move d7. He had a couple of other ways to do this. Had he taken this, suddenly the move rook e4 comes in, and it's really bad news for the white king. So instead, we have knight f6, bishop f6, d7, and Alexei Shirov sacrifices the rook. That is just pawn takes rook. That is not a joke. Takes, takes. He's given up a full rook. But he has outcalculated Vladimir Kramnik. This position is not really a rook down for black because this rook cannot move. Look at the control of the white king. The king cannot run through the field at all. All right, we got snipers in the mountains. This is really, really bad. Not to mention this from the other side as well. EF3 is about to win the game, literally. EF3 is just game over. It's good night. It's checkmate in a few moves. So the only move here for Kramnik is queen e3. And now Shirov takes, which removes the defender, okay? Queen takes b6, and he throws in a check. Now the queen is hanging. It could retreat, but then there would be e takes f3. The king would run, and bishop f2, knight f2, black would play check. And end in a position where he is up four pawns you do not want to get in a fist fight with alexei shirov in chess terms and also maybe back then maybe he was also like a really good boxer so now we get into a position where the end game is completely unwinnable for white the bishop pair is incredibly strong for black and i think you know where this is headed kramnik fights back and perhaps there is a chance here that shirov can make the draw but uh, he's got no business making no draw. He plays bishop b4 and just grabs, and he's got three pawns. And now there's going to be an avalanche from Spain. Sure, of originally from Latvia, but has lived in Spain for many, many, many years. He plays h3, plays f5, bishop e4, and the pawns just fall forward. There is no stopping them. Kramnik plays b5 and resigns. Wow. Alexei Shirov just won the candidates match. What happens next? Well, at the closing press conference of the match, according to Vladimir Kramnik, he was handed a check for $70,000. 70. ,000. What happened to 200,000? Well, they told him the check was originally supposed to be for $100,000, but there was some sort of local taxes that he had never heard about in any of the legal process. And they told him that he would be receiving the second half of that check in the future. He never received that second half, but he did receive 70k. In his own words, Kramnik in this interview said the training for this match was 60 to 70 thousand dollars. So he basically broke even, busted his ass, hauled his ass across the world just like Shirov. Nothing happened, literally zero. But Alexei Shirov's come out with nothing, but he has come out with a qualification spot to play against Garry Kasparov in the World Chess Championship. But this is where things get crazy. Kasparov was in touch with a Spanish organizer. An organizer that had put on the Linares event, for example. Linares, L-I-N-A-R-E-S, L -I -N -A -R -E -S, was one of the most prestigious events for many, many years at top-level chess. Now, this organizer, as the story goes, was in touch with the Andalusian government, which is a region, an autonomous region in southern Spain. And there had been a shift in the ministry of the Andalusian government. The new ministry had no intention to invest 
in World Chess Championship activities. Shirov had accepted this match with Kramnik and zero dollars because he was guaranteed a $1.9 million payout in a match versus Garry Kasparov. Now, at the time as well, it's important, Kasparov had an overwhelming score versus Shirov. Shirov was clearly probably the fourth or fifth best player in the world. Kramnik and Anand were up there. They were really number two and three, and you could sell that match, it seems, a little bit better than the match for Kasparov Shirov. But suddenly there was no money. The man just went through a match to get no money and just got told there's no money left. Kasparov was scrambling. As the story goes, Kasparov found an opportunity with a new sponsor in California for $600,000. $400,000 to the winner, $200,000 to the loser. Shirov was like, are you insane? Not to Kasparov, just in general. He's like, I just played two matches for $200,000? Now, to some of you, that might be like, oh my God, I should have taken it. Folks, do you know how much training costs? These, these are six-month training camps with some of the best trainers in the world. Physical exercise, food, costs, all these different things. Shirov was like, no, what? Are you insane? You, you told me if I took a prize fund of literally no money, I was going to get this prize fund of one million for the loser. And that was it. He didn't want to play. And it seems like negotiations died down. Can you imagine? Now, some of you might say he should have just taken. No, let's, I mean, imagine yourself in that situation. One of the top five players in the world. You have a verbal agreement to some sort of sponsored event after, you know, you played the match. And this story has a pretty crazy ending. Well, uh, Shirov does not get the opportunity to play Kasparov. And a few years later, they decided they were going to put on Kasparov versus Anand rematch, right? They were going to do that match again. And they had a sponsor, Brain Games. And the prize fund was $1.9 million. In fact, about $2 million. And for some reason or another, Anand had declined. This one, I actually don't exactly know why. I watched the Kramnik interview, and Kramnik talked about how he spoke with Anand about why he had declined to play the match, and it wasn't exactly clear even to Kramnik, which just sounds kind of obscure. I don't exactly understand how that conversation can go, but Anand declined, and Kramnik was like, are you okay if I accept? Yes. That's how the 2000 World Chess Championship happened. They literally had a sponsor. And they said, like a year or two later, in the year 2000, they said, Anand, you play. Anand was like, nah, I'm good, for his own reasons. And they said, Kramnik, you play. And he was like, okay. And he won. And he went on to win $1.3 million and the World Chess Championship in the year 2000, after losing the candidates match in 1998. The moral of the story here, the epilogue of this crazy story, is the fact that I don't know who, I, I don't think any of the players are to blame. Gary Kasparov did not do really anything wrong. It's more of a question of, as Kramnik said in his own words, it seemed like Gary had maybe put his trust in the wrong people, right? Like the wrong organizer. You see this, this organizer uh, in Spain who had basically promised the funding through the ministry uh, in the government because the government was investing heavily in chess. But when that changed, the money no longer became available. And Kasparov said it himself. He said, look, I, I tried to make it up to Shirov. Uh, I also suffered a lot of losses. I was preparing so long for this match with Shirov just for it not to materialize. And ultimately, the sponsors came later. But the sponsors only wanted Anand or Kramnik. And that's basically what happened. And this is the story of how one of the best chess players in the world played a match qualified theoretically for the world chess championship never got the opportunity to play it didn't get paid for the first match and ultimately did not receive the opportunity to play for a potential 1.9 million dollar overall prize fund against the world chess champion so how's your day going